welcome to Star Trek Comic Book Review. Hope everybody enjoyed last month's Halloween issues with all the Red Jack comics that we reviewed. This month we are doing Pike. So November of 2023, we were going to be re-releasing many of our classic Pike episodes from both Marvel and IDW, along with some of the newer Strange New Worlds issues. Please go ahead and like and subscribe and enjoy the show. So this uh, came out in February of 1997, and it was entitled Flesh of My Flesh. And uh, the credits are Dan Abnett and Ian Edginton were the writers. Patrick uh, Zercher was the penciler. Uh, Greg Adams, inker. Marie Jevins, colorist. Uh, Janice Chiang, letterer. Bobby Chase, editor. Oh, actually, that Janice was letterer. This Bobby Chase is editor, and Bob Harris is editor in chief. Okay, so we start off with uh, Captain Christopher Pike and the crew of the USS Enterprise are ordered to divert from their scheduled mission to the Marat system to investigate the disappearance of some crew uh, disappearance of crews of several small ships. Um, aboard the uh, aboard the Enterprise, the crew all checks in, uh, so we get a nice uh, shot of all the all the folks on the bridge. Uh, you'll notice that there's a slight difference of uh, crew members than what we see in the episode The Cage. So this is supposed to happen shortly before that episode. Uh, the new folks that you've seen before is a uh, a Laurin, Lirin, uh, alien. His name is Nano. Uh, a woman named uh, Sita Mohindas. And a Native American engineer named Moves with Burning Grace. And there's also a close friend of Pike's uh, by the name of Yeoman Cusack. All right, so uh, as they're going to investigate the missing, uh, missing crews of the ship, uh, they're intercepted by uh, a monster beast monster that warps it and has long, long spikes and tentacles. So the tentacles, uh, or excuse me, the alien craft attempts to make contact, uh, but the computer and nano are unable to comprehend it. And then there's this huge buildup of energy, and the Enterprise is just engulfed in this white energy. So now we get a flashback of Pike investigating or inspecting the uh, Enterprise in dry dock with uh, Captain April. So April's uh, giving... Pike the the lecture uh, and handing over the 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 command of the Enterprise to Pike. Uh, he says that uh, Pike will have uh, only woman who will who he'll ever give his heart to. Obviously referring to the Enterprise. And then he also repeats the uh, same sentiment that we hear from Kirk and Picard <laughs> later on, where he says, "You need to fight promotions and you always need to stay with your ship." Yeah. So as they're departing, April asks if he's uh, already picked the first officer, and if not, he may have an idea, and then it, then it cuts back to the present. So everybody on the bridge is breaking up after the attack. Uh, number one, to discover that he's missing, and a ship is hanged in pencils and is being dragged by the alien left. Her voice, who we did see in the episode of The Cage, Arrives on the bridge, starts to to everybody. Then we flash, we flash to uh, a picture of Pike, and uh, he's naked, and he's like in the fetal position, and he starts remembering. So we then get a flashback of his first interview with number one, and uh, we're introduced to her. She uh, says she has hopes of commanding a science vessel. She's only a lieutenant commander, so I, I thought that was odd. So she's a lieutenant commander, but she hopes that her next assignment will be commanding a science vessel. But uh, Pike asks her to become executive officer of the Enterprise, uh, which she accepts. Um, and then he, he attempts her, her name, refers to her as Robert, uh, Lieutenant Robbins Yuri, and then she cuts him off saying, number one, will be fine. So we never get what her name is. <laughs> All right, so back to the bridge. The doctor informs number one that everybody was secretly experimented on while they were all knocked out. And then he reminds her that with Pike gone, she is in charge. So Spock's there. He uh, requests to borrow the doctor's tricorder to investigate the uh, the tentacles. So now we flash back to Pike and number one interviewing a cadet Spock. Uh, they are about two and a half years into their first five-year mission. 
uh, they're going to go to some area of space, and uh, they're basically asking Spock to uh, become an intern, and he agrees, so he'll be placed on the Enterprise as the science officer. So then we flash back to Spock um, informing the crew of his findings. The ship uh, has infected – the alien ship has infected the Enterprise with uh, some sort of organic computer virus that's leaching the power. So they predict that they only have a few hours left until they'll be either wherever the alien wants them to be or they'll be completely powerless. So number one starts to organize an away team to board the vessel and save Pike. So then we flash back to uh, Pike and Yeoman Cusack going over um, some crew rosters to uh, help fill out the, uh, the, the, the crew for the, their second five-year mission. All right, so then we uh, now flash back to a uh, high inside the alien ship, and he has all these nasty-looking alien tubes running through his body. And it's uh, aliens start talking to him, and he's being forced to relive all these uh, images for some reason. And the po aliens inform him that he's about to be harvested. All right, just then the uh, the way he uh, frees Pike using the laser guns. And as they're escaping, uh, number one is grabbed. Uh, Nano is able to use his pyrotechnic skills to just burst the tentacle flame. Uh, eventually, they encounter the true beings in there. Uh, they introduce themselves as the Golter. How would you? Yeah, sounds as good as any. The Golter. The Golter. Uh, so basically, the Nagolter say that they're going to harvest the crew, and they just don't understand why the crew is resisting the uh, sacred harmony of the uh, harvesting. Sure. So as the Nagolter is about to physically attack the crew, they are beamed back aboard the Enterprise, uh, just in the nick of time. So Spock uh, explains that he's able to start curing the uh, Enterprise uh, by removing this uh, organic virus. Uh, just as the Enterprise uh, is, I don't know, it, it's, it reaches its destination. It's this monstrous mothership, and it's like a planet-sized – I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it's Or moon-sized. Yeah, big. okay. It's moon-sized. It's still gigantic. Death Star-sized. <laughs> so they reach it, and, it, and it's all organic. It looks like this monstrous uh, tentacled monster thing. Reminding it's a tumor. Me, it's like a, a big tumor? tumor or something. Yeah, I can see that. It's nasty looking, whatever it is. So uh, the uh, it starts grabbing the Enterprise with its tentacles, um, and uh, the Enterprise is able to use their phasers to cut free, and then as the mothership's about to completely engulf them, P uh, Pike fires a photon torpedo at point-blank range, which just completely destroys this the whole ship. And they're able to escape through safe to uh, they're able to escape to safety. Uh, Pike feels remorse that they just discovered a new race and they had to destroy it completely. And then the Enterprise continues on its previous uh, previous heading to the Marat system. The end. I guess it does kind of look like a tumor or a gigantic booger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you're gonna say, booger. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's it's this uh, this asymmetrical, just like oval thing with tentacles and like pustules on top of it. It's just just nasty. It's nasty. It, it could be kind of like maybe a a giant jellyfish. Maybe that's what they were going for. Yeah, yeah I don't be. know. It, it's pretty nasty looking. And you know that little ship that picked it up was bigger than the Enterprise, and and this thing is just monstrous compared to either one of those. Yeah. Yeah, so it's funny at the end about how Pike uh, feels such remorse about blowing away this life form and stuff. But really, come on, that was that was they were going to kill you, man. I mean, it, it was self defense. That that's the problem you have. The problem, problem that was the one shot, and it just completely destroys this whole planet size. Well, you, it, it's like hitting the ventilation port on the Death Star because <laughs> uh, well, I, I know it's a little ridiculous, but uh, I mean it. They, they shot the photons down its throat or something, didn't they? Well, they did they? say they were going to do that, but there's not really a throat there. I thought it was more just a saying. Right. Oh, I get you. I see what you're you saying. Know, like, yeah. shoot it up their tailpipe, you know, something like that. <laughs> exactly. 
Well, obviously they hit the exhaust port that mattered, that went to the central reactor, I yeah. guess. At least yeah. that's what you're supposed to believe. I, I didn't think about Star Wars, but yeah, uh, totally the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Only they didn't have to cruise along the outside of it. Now, when, it, when, when that thing does explode, you get this beautiful picture of the explosion and just and it looks guts. like that, that organic matter is just flying everywhere. And then you see the Enterprise riding out the shockwave. It's, it's a really cool picture. Yeah, something about this series is they like to do a lot of two-page spreads. And, uh, you know, they, most of them are quite good. They take their time. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, well, there's one, two, there's at least three of them in this this issue. Yeah, this issue was really long, so that was why my synopsis was, it seemed like I was getting a little uh, a little windy there, like I was talking for a long time. But I guess it was, it was like 48 pages long. Like it says on the cover, double-sized, yeah. fantastic first issue. And it was pretty good. I think it was quite good, too. I liked it. But about that explosion there at the end, and they're riding the shockwave. Now, that's not even though it was a good 12 years before the new Star Trek movie came out. Uh, that I saw had Christopher Pike in it, played by, um, uh, what's his name? Nowhere Man. The guy who played on Nowhere Man. I forgot his name. But anyways. But when they blew up the the black hole, and they're riding out that shockwave, to me this, this right. picture kind of looks just like that. Right. Same idea, anyway. Yeah. But it's just a cool visual. Like, yeah, very action-packed. I really like the cover. Because you get this it, action it, shot of all the key people. It, exactly. So they got a lot of nice insets where they got the main center of action, uh, three of the crewmen with Pike blasting away uh, in, a, in a kneeling position, then, then Spock's head over the, over the shoulder, then Enterprise firing, uh, Federation, uh, United Federation planet symbol, and then guys getting transported. They even have a shuttlecraft. I didn't notice that. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah, if you get that pesky really barcode out of the way, it would look even better. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, see this cover right here. If that was a, if that was a poster, I would definitely buy it. What'd you think of the the laser guns? Or do they actually call them phasers in here? They're they're supposed to be laser guns, right? Because in the cage, don't they refer to them as lasers with an L instead of a PH? Uh that's a really good question. Uh, that they might have. I don't remember that, but it's very possible. Yeah, I'm pretty. Uh, I, I... Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember in any. I don't think any of these three issues, I don't, re- I don't recall them saying directly what they are. Uh, I think at some point they do. They actually call it Phaser, and I was like, no, it's not. Maybe it was in one of the other two books. I don't see it in my notes for issue number one. I thought it was when yeah. they were getting sh- they're shooting, shooting out, but shooting out of the tentacles, but I might be wrong. So on the first big spread page, though, I thought the one crewman, the helmsman station, I forgot his name, but he looks like he's got Johnny Storm hair or something. Oh, yeah, his name is uh, Tyler, isn't it? Lieutenant Tyler? Uh, yeah, Tyler, something like that, right. Yeah. Now, he was actually in the episode, right? He's one of the – I didn't mention him earlier because he was actually in the, the Cage episode, right? Well, if that's the same guy. I don't remember from the, from the pilot them mentioning his name. They might have. I'd have to go back and look at the, uh, at the video again. Uh, sim- s- similar look. It could have been. I think it's supposed to be him, right. but, I mean – but this woman here, the uh, the woman that's at the the other station, right next to him. I mean, she she wasn't in the show. No, no, pretty much. Um, it was number one, and then that other yeoman, young one that was uh, that ended up down on the on the planet. Yeah, her name was Colt. Colt, what a great name. Yeah, yeah. so so definitely there weren't that. There, there were definitely in the original pilot, there weren't as many women in key uh, character positions. At least in this revision, fresh look at, at that time period, uh, there are more. Now, was Colt, the, the woman that we were talking about, was she yeoman or what was her role? Because I don't remember it ever actually saying. She um, seemed I like think... she had a bigger role than yeoman Rand does in the... Uh, I don't remember exactly just because it's been a while since I've watched that, except for watching the first nine minutes into it, as you suggested a few days ago. But in my a few neurons, a few memory cells firing, I thought she was a yeoman, but they really didn't show her that much. And then I'm yeah. going to prove my ignorance here, but I've never quite understood what a yeoman does. I, I always thought yeoman were, um, were low-ranked officers. 
Because cause Yeoman ran, I mean, she seemed like she just would hand him stuff to sign and <laughs> bring him coffee or something. I don't remember her yeah. actually having a function. I, I thought the Yeomans were like uh, low-rank officers that were like assistants. Yeah, exactly. That's what I thought too. But this this guy, this Yeoman uh, Cusack, I mean, he, he's – he, he's like a right-hand guy without the rank. Right. I mean, he's helping Pike uh, decide on which crew members uh, he should pick for the next away missions or the uh, – sorry, the five-year mission. Right. I mean, he seems like – he definitely has the captain's ear at all times. Yeah, and he's a and he's a, an irreverent uh, jokester about it too. He seems pretty funny. I really like him. Yeah, a, a good character. Who they're definitely set up, setting up as uh... – as somebody very important in Pike's life. Right. So uh, For a very specific purpose in issue three. And, and the whole comment about how, how, how focal a character uh, Yeoman Cusack is uh, in, in this series, um, I, I, think it's, I think it just underscores the idea that captains can run their ships and they can do it any way they want to. So if they want to bring a beagle on board, they can do it. And if they <laughs> want to uh, have a Yeoman who is a right-hand guy... Uh, in some ways, uh, more so. In some ways, more so than even number one. Yeah, that's what the captain does. Yeah, it's captain's prerogative. Exactly. So, what do you think about Robert April parts, where we get to walk around the, the? I mean, they're actually walking around the Enterprise versus flying around it. But uh, I thought it was a nice little nod to to other Star Trek when they show off the ship for the first time. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Uh, and also, how often are we treated to the one captain handing off a ship to the next? Like never. Or at least I don't remember that ever happening before. I think that was kind of cool. Plus, actually seeing April depicted, even though the first time we see April, uh, quite frankly, looks a little bit like Lauren Green. Oh, he does kind of. A little well, bit. Well, I think April was always supposed to be Gene Roddenberry. Ah, so, really? In fact, in a lot of uh, like the uh, Star Trek encyclopedia and stuff like that, anytime it mentioned Robert April, mm-hmm. the picture was, was this drawing or this guy that looked... I mean, or was a, just a true picture of Gene Roddenberry. Yeah, that's cool. And Robert April was in one episode of the uh, the animated series. Um, and so in that, you know, it was a cartoon, so he didn't quite look like Gene Roddenberry. But right. uh, he was, you know, an older man. And uh, he didn't quite look like he does here, but I, I guess you could go with it that it's the same guy. But I really liked it. I, and, I, you know, the, the only part that I didn't like was when he said the exact same sentence that Kirk and Picard <laughs> were saying, which is, don't let them promote you. Exactly. Yeah, I, I thought I thought that was really uh, – what's interesting is um, a lot of these guys, whether it be the the New Frontier issues or these, they, they definitely do um, borrow from the – from the history of what's gone before in the series, whether it be movies or the TV shows or even uh, novels mm-hmm. or cartoon series. Um, I, I, I do like that. And we'll yeah, see more of that as we get to the other issues. Exactly. The borrowing. I think I know what you're talking about, but uh, we'll wait till we get there. Issue number two. I, I'm just saying issue number two. Yeah, well, like let's, the, let's la- the last page. <laughs> yes. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. Well, the last thing I had about this is just the the technology. I like how they're really using the look of the the cage, which was you know they had different guns and different communicators than they do in the Kirk era. Right. So I think it's a nice little nod or uh, detail, a nice little attention to detail that uh, makes it feel I don't know like this truly could have been a prequel to the cage. Right. Consistency. I like that. And that gun is probably one of my favorite guns. It's yeah. just gigantic barrel and everything. Yeah, I, I like it a lot better than the ones they used in Enterprise. In Enterprise, I can't remember how, what the guns look like there. You don't? You don't? Oh, uh, I, I thought you liked yeah. Enterprise. I thought you liked I the loved phasers. Enterprise. It's one of my favorites. Do you remember what the phasers look like? It's not coming to me right away. Yeah, well, it's kind of bulbous. It's a little kind of kind of kind of thick and chunky looking uh, <laughs> above the handle. Did it look kind of like the next generation phasers with just a with like a hand grip on it? No, it does not look like a dustbuster. <laughs> okay. It looks it looks like a traditional kind of you know you know Colt forty five kind of pistol. Only um, it's almost like 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 curve and oval shaped uh, on the top part of it. Mm, I'll have to 
pull those out and watch them. You should do that. I can't pull out a comic book because as of today, there has never been a Enterprise comic book. And I oh. think that's that's a huge miss because I loved Enterprise. And I think it got canceled way too early. Yeah. And I would love to see it continued in its own comic book. It's never been in anything. You were just breaking up there a little bit. Let's hope that oh. doesn't happen again. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I, I liked Enterprise too, but because of the low ratings, the perceived lack of success, we will see if anybody jumps on that that bandwagon. Well, uh, they're making TV series or they're making comic book series out of <laughs> Assignment Earth and things like that. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah, good point. Good point. But that was a really good episode. I really liked Assignment Earth. Yeah, but it wasn't as good as Enterprise as a whole, I would argue. Yeah, well, what's better? I mean, they're both good. They're, 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 they're entertaining. Uh, yeah. And I will say that um, uh, multiple novels ha- were written that included Gary uh, Seven also. Yep. But we'll talk about those when we start reviewing the Assignment Earth ish- uh, issues. Yes. All right. So you want to go straight into episode or issue number two, or do you have anything else about this one? Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that Dr. Boyce, um, mm-hmm. I did not remember that being the same name as the doctor in the uh, pilot cage, but it very possible. But I will say that the Dr. Po- Boyce depicted in, um, in the comic book, these comic books, th- doesn't really seem to look much like the guy in the, the actor in the pilot. Yeah, I don't remember him having the two-toned hair color like he does here. Right. But I was thinking that that was his name. It could, but, it, it very, very well could have been. But I'm just saying, the look of the guy isn't the same. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, this guy looks a little bit more rugged. Yeah, he has the like the uh, Mister Fantastic hairstyle. <laughs> exactly. Dark on top, and then he has the uh, gray streaks there at the temples. Yep. And the way he's depicted, at least I assume that's Doctor Boyce on the cover. Um, on the cover, if that truly is him, because he has the same kind of uh, dark hair on the top, uh, graying on the temples, hair, uh, he looks a lot more like a, you know, a little bit more like a marine or something, you know, somebody you don't want to mess with as opposed to a doctor. Really, eh, that's about it. That's, that's pretty much it. I, I, I do like that when, when they do, when you finally do see where Pike's being held, because in the middle of the, of the comic where they're uh, showing Pike being mentally um, attacked, in some kind of dark space where there's just little de- geometric shapes and stuff, uh, mm-hmm. in a space where he can't, uh, where Pike himself can't see, but you can kind of see him. When it finally shows where he actually is, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, where they basically he's naked and uh, <laughs> completely uh, wrapped up in all these tentacles and stuff, and he's in a real nasty situation here. Yeah, it's it's pretty nasty because those tubes are like going all inside of him and stuff. I mean, it's pretty nasty. Right, and then just in the nick of time where they do save him, as you had mentioned with the phasers blasting, it looks like these knives and stuff are heading his head, Pike's head. So I think that was pretty good. Uh, a little dramatic, but uh, you know, pretty good. Oh my God, how's he gonna get out of this one? And then whammo, phasers firing just in the nick of time. It, it was pretty cool. It was. I, I thought this issue was really good. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good one. Double size. Thank you for watching Star Trek Comic Book Review. This was an excerpt of episode 13 of the podcast. Please look forward to all the other Captain Pike related episodes that we're planning to release in the month of November. Please go ahead and like and subscribe to this video. All our podcasts are available on iTunes or other podcast platforms. 